Kevin Roos, you've written a new book called Future Proof. And the book begins with a conversation you had at a cocktail party where a startup, a tech startup founder used the term boomer remover, which scared the bejesus out of me. What did he mean by that? Yeah, well, this was a, a guy who had created an AI software product that was capable of basically doing what's called production planning. So in big factories, they have these people who say, you know, this machine should make this piece or this part on this day. Um, and they sort of arrange the work of the factory that way. And, and what this guy was saying is, we figured out how to automate that. We, we can do this with AI now. And uh, that really startled me. And, and you know, he, can, he was very excited about the fact that companies would be able to remove their boomers uh, to replace the sort of middle managers who are older and higher earning um, and get rid of their costs that way. And this is happening in industries, not just in manufacturing, not just sort of blue collar factory jobs, but this is happening in white collar workplaces now too, um, to people like journalists and lawyers and accountants, doctors, um, people you know in finance, um, they are all at risk of being replaced um, if they don't do something about it. And so one of the reasons I wrote this book is to try to help people, um, including myself, figure out what the heck do we do about this? How do we make sure that we are not the, the target of the next boomer remover? Before we talk about what we do about it, Kevin, why don't we talk a little bit about the ethics? Because many of these jobs, you mentioned lawyers, doctors, journalists, they require judgment. They require nuance. They require uh, thoughtful consideration that I imagine AI cannot necessarily replace. Well, you would be surprised. I mean, a lot of AI is going beyond just kind of rote, repetitive work now. It's doing things like predicting uh, outcomes and analyzing data, um, forecasting sales. There are now even, even fashion design companies that use AI to create new designs. So I think we tend to think of the sort of so-called creative professions as being immune from automation, but they're really not. There are now AI programs that can write music, that, that can create movies, that can you know make video game levels. Um, there are a lot of people employed in these industries whose jobs are not safe. And you give some pretty startling statistics, Kevin, and we're not talking about the distant future. We're talking about the near future. We're talking about right now. I mean, this is happening um, all over the world right now. And in, especially in the past year, COVID has really accelerated the adoption of AI and automation inside companies. Um, and, you know, it's, it's really like happening at a speed that I don't think people fully understand. Um, McKinsey just uh, sort of upped its estimate of the number of people who are going to be displaced to automation. It, it used to be 37 million um, by the year 2030. And then since the pandemic, they've changed that to 45 million. When you read those statistics, I mean, what kind of impact will that have on the nation's economy? Well, it's going to radically change it. I mean, it's going to mean that certain careers that were stable um, and, 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 you know, in some cases quite well paying and that required college degrees and specialized training are now not going to be viable for people. And I think it's going to force people to look for skills that are future proof for ways that they can adjust their careers and their training so that they're not as automatable. Um, and I think that's going to be true of people in factories and it's going to be true of people in law offices and, and hospitals and, and news, newsrooms. Um, I think everyone is going to have to go through this process of figuring out what can I do that can't be done by a machine. We're talking about 45 million people being replaced by automation in nine years. This is not the distant future. This is happening as we speak. You wanted to future proof yourself, but I imagine that kids in high school and college right now better be thinking about this as they start to consider their careers, right? Absolutely. And and the the really sort of the, the bad news is that this dislocation is happening really fast and it's happening to a lot of people. The good news is that it doesn't actually require going back to school, learning a new subject. Um, I think for a long time, we've told people that the way to survive in the future was to basically become more like a machine to, you know, major in science or engineering or, 
or uh, you know, to, to go into a STEM field, to be hyper productive, to kind of optimize your time, to hustle and grind and all these things that we associate with sort of being successful now. But the, the thing that I heard from AI researchers and the people that I interviewed for this book is that that's actually exactly the wrong way to look at this because we need to be better at doing the kinds of human things that machines can't do, which means figuring out what those things are. And they're not, it's not, you know, skills like coding. Um, it's skills like empathy and communication, critical thinking, moral courage. It's the kind of things that are very, very hard for computers to learn how to do. And those are the places that we need to focus our time and energy and not on, you know, figuring out what programming language will, uh, will, will let us get a job. Well, that sounds lovely, Kevin, but can you give me an example of how you get a job because of a, well, how you prove a, your moral courage and how that fits into the modern working world in, in practical terms. Yeah. So a good example that I, I use in the book is, is, is uh, a guy I know named Russ and he's actually my accountant. Uh, he does my taxes for me every, every April. Actually, I got to call him pretty soon for this year's taxes. <laughs> and, um, and he is, working in an industry that has largely been automated. Um, TurboTax automated a lot of those, uh, those accounting and tax preparation jobs uh, decades ago. But Russ has been able to stay in, in the business because he's a former stand-up comedian. And he makes his work really fun and really funny. Like I have legitimately had a great time talking about itemized deductions with him. Um, and so he hires a bunch of other really funny, really personable accountants. And he pays for them all to take improv comedy classes because he thinks it makes them better at relating to people. And, and he's right. Like people enjoy going to his firm for tax advice and, and tax preparation, and they don't get that from TurboTax. And so those are the kinds of skills that are able to sort of differentiate people from machines and make it possible to stay employed in an industry even after automation comes in and takes out a lot of the jobs. You're talking about someone who can make the experience better because their human connection and qualities, as you mentioned, like empathy. Yeah, and laughter and joy and 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 human connection. I mean, we are social animals and a lot of our economy right now is structured around making and doing things for people, but it's becoming really quickly restructured around jobs that involve making people feel and experience things. So if you are selling widgets in a factory like that or you're making widgets in a factory, that's not a job that probably already that, that probably already got automated but if it hasn't it's going to be and the new jobs that are that are coming up and the jobs that are going to become increasingly valuable are the ones that involve connecting with people that involve um, you know surprising them involve you know making them feel heard and, and respected and listened to um, and that's not just about becoming therapists and social workers people in all all fields can do that give me examples though of uh jobs of the future that may require this ability to connect or, you know, be human? Well, I think we see it already happening in a lot of industries um, under this sort of artisanal craftsmanship label. Um, like I live in Oakland, California, and there's a whole sort of street here where it's like the 19th century. I mean, there are candle makers and blacksmiths and people, you know, hammering out uh, you know, pots and things like that. I mean, it's really like, it's really like stepping back into a Renaissance fair almost. But those jobs are really valuable uh, in this new economy because it's not something that you can just go pick up a target. A human created those things. And because of that, it has value attached to it. Um, and in the future, a lot of the things that are currently done by machines are going to become really, really uh, inexpensive and not very valuable. And a lot of the things that are done by humans are going to become valuable precisely because they involve human creativity and expertise. I know a lot of AI optimists say that while new technology may displace some workers, it will spur economic growth and create even better, more fulfilling jobs. But you say, hold on when it comes to that, that assumption. Why? Well, there are two things I think are wrong with that assumption. One is this assumption that our previous waves of technological change have been good for people. 
um, in, in, in the time that, that they occur. So I went back, I read a lot of books and, and, you know, contemporaneous accounts of the industrial revolution and the, the electrification of, of America, um, the wave of factory automation that happened in the 1960s and seventies. And these were not happy times for a lot of workers. I think we've sort of romanticized those periods in our history. You know, we used to work on farms and now we work in factories and those jobs are better and, and everyone's happier. And that's not really how people experience those jobs. And they also, you know, don't really reap the benefits of, of you know, this technology um, in their paychecks. They don't, their, their wages don't reflect the increased productivity. So that's one mistake. The other thing I think we, we, we make, the other mistake I think we make is not accounting for the kind of automation that is happening. So I, there's a paper, uh, some research that's been done by a couple of economists at MIT and Boston University. And they talk about this concept of so-so automation, basically like robots that aren't very good. They're like good enough to replace people, but they actually don't make the economy better and more productive. And they don't create the new jobs that technology often creates. So a good example of this would be like the machine at the grocery store that lets you check yourself out. And like, I don't know about you, but I find those things incredibly frustrating. Um, they're not fast, you know, they, they, they screw up and you have to call someone over to like help you fix it. It doesn't like make your experience of buying groceries cheaper or faster or more pleasant. It just allows the guy who owns the store to staff fewer workers on a shift. So like those are the kinds of automation we're getting a lot today are these kind of automation types that are just barely good enough to replace humans and take costs away from a business, but not actually to make the economy more productive and dynamic or to invent new jobs that didn't exist before. Well, if you need some help with the automatic uh, grocery store checkout situation, maybe this boomer, Kevin, could give you some instructions because I'm not having any trouble with that. Well, you you may have some unlocked some secret that I don't have, or maybe your grocery store just has better machines than my grocery store. I'm just kidding. Okay, and a couple other questions. What's going to happen to these 45 million people who are going to be out of work? And do you think that that helps propel Andrew Yang's argument for universal basic income? Because how can we have that many people without jobs, especially considering how little in this country is spent on retraining? a tiny percentage of the GDP, as you know. Yeah, retraining is sort of the, the, the kind of conventional solution that people propose. And I'm, I'm not very optimistic about retraining. I don't think it's, you know, it, it's really hard to teach someone new skills. And there have been some studies of like, you know, they, they took a bunch of coal miners and they tried to train them to be computer programmers. And like, it didn't work out so well because those are very different skill sets and people are not, you know, always that adaptable that quickly. Um, so I think a lot of people will, will you know, they'll find work, but it won't necessarily be the kind of stable, um, you know, middle class work that they are used to. Um, it'll be gig work. It'll be, you know, driving for Uber. It'll be, you know, being a DoorDash person. Uh, I think there are some, you know, some jobs that will crop up to replace the ones that are lost, but there, there may not be as many of them and they may not be accessible to the same people who lost their jobs. They may require different skills, different training, different education. Um, and so I think, yeah, it does, it does make you think that something like universal basic income is going to be necessary because otherwise, I mean, what we see from previous generations is this stuff used to take a long time. The Industrial Revolution was a, was a, a more than 50-year process. Um, and so people had time to kind of see the danger coming, to sort of anticipate it, to you know figure out what they could do that wasn't their current job, like what skills they would need to adapt. But this is all happening so fast now that I think it's going to catch a lot of people by surprise. And in other countries, they actually have systems to deal with this. In Sweden, there are these job councils that if you get laid off because your job is automated, you these job councils sort of catch you, they provide a safety net. They pay for you to, you know, they pay your unemployment. They pay for you to retrain for a different job. In Japan, there's a similar system. So other countries have dealt with this before with their blue collar workforces. And I think we need a real um, strategy for this because this is not, you know, going to be, as you say, it's not going to be a few people and it's not going to be in a few industries. This is going to be pretty widespread. 
What about labor unions? Is there a role for them to play in this whole situation? Absolutely. I mean, one of the things that we saw in the 1960s and 70s when auto plants and other manufacturing plants were, were getting robots for the first time was that the unions played a big role in not just, you know, they weren't just fighting the robots. They weren't saying we don't want to automate. They were saying we want to have a say in how these robots are implemented, what they're doing, how they're working. And we want to be, you know, if, if, the, if these robots are making the company more productive and more profitable, like we want to see some of that in our paychecks. And they were able to actually make that transition a lot smoother because they could push back on the executives who just wanted to automate as fast and as recklessly as possible and say, wait a minute, there's actually more to think about here. Uh, at GM, they had these worker automation councils that helped management install and you know get the first robots into the factories. And that really helped workers. So I don't think this is all necessarily bad for workers. I think AI and automation could be great for, for workers. Um, but it matters how we do it and it matters who benefits from it. Um, and if it's just executives using AI and automation to exploit workers and get rid of them, that's going to be a very different picture than if we have executives who are using these things to improve workers' lives and to, to spread the gains from automation more fairly among them. Before we talk about your roles for humans in the age of automation, I just have to ask that obnoxious boomer remover dude you met at the cocktail party, is his idea to just get rid of people altogether? Is that his fantasy? It sounded like it. I mean, the, the, the thing that is hard about reporting on this is that nobody wants to, that was actually an uncharacteristically honest conversation. Usually when you ask people on the record, you know, what does your software product do? Um, they'll say, oh, well, it, you know, it um, it frees people from their menial tasks and it allows them to concentrate on higher value work. And, you know, they'll swear up and down that people aren't being replaced. But if you catch people in an honest moment, and I did manage to catch a few CEOs and, and executives in an honest moment, they'll say, yeah, we don't want to have as many people working in the billing department. And this is the way that we're going to do that. You were motivated, Kevin, because you are 33 years old. You want to prepare for the future. But do you really believe that journalists are going to be replaced by machines? I have to ask you that for my own uh, interests. Some of them already have been. Um, I mean, my first job in journalism involved writing corporate earnings reports. You know, I would do the story that said, you know, uh, Coca Cola made this much money last quarter you know, in their beverages division and they lost money in this other, like, like those sort of formulaic earnings stories. And those are now being written by machines. Um, a lot of news organizations don't have humans doing that anymore. And so those kinds of jobs have already disappeared. Um, there are other kinds of jobs that I think are going to disappear. For example, in China, they, they've they experimented with using uh, AIs and sort of hologram type things to to become news anchors, to read the news. Um, so it's not uh, it's not all there yet. The technology is still being improved, but it's advancing really, really rapidly. And you know, there the, I think last year there was a a story in the Guardian um, that was an op-ed that was written entirely by an algorithm, and uh, and the, the editor's note at the bottom said something like, "This was actually easier to edit than many human op-eds. <laughs> they made fewer mistakes." Mm -hmm. So I think we we are being overconfident if we think that this could never happen to us. And robot anchors, you don't have to pay them or deal with their egos. So there's that, right? Exactly. No hair and makeup. I mean, they're very easy to uh, to to deal with. Okay, let's talk about your rules for, for humans in the age of automation. Number one, and you can tell me quickly what this means, be surprising, social, and scarce. Yeah, surprising, social, and scarce are the three categories of work that I think are least automatable. Um, this is what I heard from AI experts, um, that work that is sort of regular and structured, um, that is about making things rather than making people feel things, and that is sort of exists in large quantities, like that's the kind of thing that AI does really well. And so humans should be doing things that are more surprising, that are more social, and that are more scarce. Resist machine drift. Yeah, machine drift is this concept I, I, I came up with to sort of figure out how to articulate the feeling of like, 
I'm no longer in control of my choices because algorithms and AI are making all of them for me. So, you know, whether it's relying on Netflix to tell us what shows to watch or Twitter to tell us what news to, you know, to, to sort of partake in, um, we are turning over a lot more of our choices and our agency to AI. And so I think we need to resist that and, and, and bring those choices back into our own minds and into our own brains. Demote your devices. Yeah, this is about your phone, which is a robot in your pocket. It's the robot that most of us deal with all day. And, uh, and it's become our bosses. It used to be a tool. Now it's our bosses. And it's not helping us be more human. In fact, at the time when we need to be more human, it's actually making us more like machines. Keep looking at me. Leave, leave handprints. Yeah, this is about how we work. Uh, this is about our jobs and, and about the need to make our jobs as human as possible, to not try to sort of erase our the traces of our humanity in our work. But even if you're an accountant or a lawyer, um, you can be more human in your work and you can make it more apparent that you are putting yourself into your work. Don't be an endpoint. This is a little complicated, but endpoints in software engineering are the things that hook up different programs to each other. Um, so there are a lot of jobs right now that involve taking things from one system and putting it into another system. Um, and those jobs are not just in factories. Those are, those are all kinds of jobs that are, are basically humans as the connecting points between different machines. And those jobs are really, really dangerous because those are the first ones to be automated. Treat AI like a chimp army. Yeah, this is an extended metaphor that people will need to read the book to figure out, but it's basically about the dangers of over automation and putting AI in, in positions of authority that it's not equipped to handle and the dangers that can result from that. Um, I think we tend to, you know, executives tend to think AI is this amazing, flawless technology, and really it has all these kind of flaws and biases that make it really dangerous to, to put in charge of your organization. Build big nets and small webs. Yeah, this is sort of the, the big scale solutions chapter. Do we need universal basic income? Do we need Medicare for all? How do we adapt our society and our communities to prepare for this wave of AI and automation? And so there are two categories in the book. I call them uh, yeah, big, uh, big webs and or big nets and small webs. Um, and those are what I think are going to help people get through this transition. Learn machine age humanities. This is the what do I teach my kids chapter. And this is all about the skills and abilities that people will need to know to succeed in this new economy, all these deeply human, irreplaceable skills. And finally, arm the rebels. Yeah, this one is about sort of not just sort of retreating from technology and saying this stuff sucks and it's dangerous and I'm going to throw my phone away and move to the woods. Um, I think we need, you know, there are people in the tech industry who realize that machines are degrading our humanity that that we um, that we need to support. We need to support people in the tech industry working on these products who are using it to try to empower people and to fight back against the dehumanization of people through these technologies. If I had a kid in high school uh, or college, what do you think is the most important piece of advice for them when they're trying to figure out what they want to do with their lives? I'd say do the thing that makes you feel most human. Do the thing that is that you are the most yourself at. So if if that's art, that's great. If it's uh, you know if it's if it's architecture, that's that's great. If it's computer programming, that's great. But I think that people really need to go where they can be the most individual because you don't want to be a cog in a machine in this in this economy. Um, that's not going to be a, a very stable option for a lot of people. And when you talk about the skills parents should now be teaching their kids from a very young age, Kevin, what are those skills and how might they differ from the skills that my parents wanted me to learn or your parents wanted you to learn? I actually think they're kind of the same skills. I think these are the timeless human skills that we often forget about as we get older. Um, there's a guy I know who's a, he's a, uh, investor and he works with a lot of AI startups and he recommends that people in tech read this book called everything I need to know. I learned in kindergarten. Do you remember that book? Yes, of course. Robert Fulgham, I think. 
Yeah. So that book is sort of about these like basic human skills and he gives it to these engineers and these startup founders, because I think a lot of us forget how to do those basic things like sharing, playing well with others, you know, being courageous. Like those are the things that I think children have always learned, but that adults sometimes forget. And I think we could all use a refresher course. Being kind and respectful. I think most people online, at least the ones that troll me, could use a refresher course in that, Kevin. Yeah, I know some folks who could use a refresher on that too. In the process of writing this book, what was the scariest thing for you when you thought, oh my God, we are doomed here? Um, I hate to end it on that note, but. Well, I, I took a trip. Uh, a couple of years ago to to Davos to the the World Economic Forum and I don't know if you've been but it's sort of the it's the Coachella of capitalism and uh and I was talking you know with all these CEOs and you know these were private dinners with billionaires and computer scientists and you know hotshot business people and the way that they talked about automation in private was super scary to me because they were basically not, I mean, their, their public statements were all, this is going to be great for workers and we're going to empower them. And this is going to allow us to enter the fourth industrial revolution. And in private, they were asking, you know, people who work at tech companies, like, how do I get rid of my call center? How do I get rid of my back office? How do I take 80% of the people out of my company and still do the same amount of work? It was this kind of, this kind of mercenary automation that I think is really scary and people need to realize that's happening. Well, on that happy note, Kevin Roos, the book is called Future Proof, Nine Rules for Humans in the Age of Automation. Thank you, Kevin. Thanks so much for having me.